Hi guys, it's Mrs. Fonis Beck. Um, I want to tell you about this author named James Howe. And James Howe has written lots of books, but one of the books, I'm not sure if you've heard of or not before, but I hope you have. It's called Benicula. And Benicula is about this bunny here. And the bunny is almost like a vampire. Get it? Like Dracula, but it's a bunny, so bun -icula. And Benicula like basically gets into the refrigerator and drains all the vegetables of like their juices and stuff. That's why this carrot's shown as white. So it says today vegetables, tomorrow the world. And um, James wrote this with his, um, his wife, Deborah. And actually this book's way older than I thought it was, but it's a really good book. I remember reading this when I was a kid in school. So some of you may have read it. I have it in my classroom library if you're interested in it. But today I wanna read you um, a different story that James Howe wrote. And this is a personal narrative. And this personal narrative, we can pull things out of this to use in your writing. Some of the techniques that he does would work really well with the writing that you do. This is a sad story. I'm gonna give you a heads up. So um, kids have cried in the past, so just a heads up on that, but it's pretty descriptive and I think that's why. Um, this is a story about when he was a kid growing up with some older brothers and he didn't really have the same interests as his older brothers or his dad. And so life's a little bit different for him. He's a little tender hearted and um, caring and compassionate towards animals. Well, his siblings and his father tend to be like hunters and have no worries or no um, issues with hunting animals and then like eating them for dinner. And James has a big issue with that. So we're, I'm gonna read this story out loud. Um, and if you have a copy of it, I'm not sure if you'll have one yet or not, but if you do have a copy of it, you can follow right along with me. I like to read this one aloud to you instead of just having you read it because sometimes I stop and talk about certain parts. So this is the story, Everything Will Be Okay. Um, and it's by James Howe. And it starts out with this quote from LeVar Burton. The world that we live in is one is the one we create. We create our world with every thought we think, with every word that we speak, and with every action that we take. Okay, so it starts right here. The kitten is a scrawny thing with burrs and bits of wood caught in its coat, where it still has fur, and pus coming out of its eyes and nose. Its big baby head looks even bigger at the end of such a stick of a body. I found it in the woods at the end of my street where I play most days with my friends. This time I was alone. Lucky for you I was, I think. Otherwise David or Claude might have decided you'd be good practice for their slingshots. Those two can be mean, I think to myself. I don't like playing with them really, but they live at the end of the street and sometimes you just play with the kids on your same street, even if they're mean, sometimes even to you. I'm gonna stop right there a second. So we, I usually talk to the kids about this. Sometimes um, you just play with the kids that live in your neighborhood, whether, you, whether they're nice to you or not, because there's somebody to play with. And sometimes we live by people that aren't always the nicest, but we still hang out with them every day and play with them every day because that's who's around. It's somebody to hang out with. And that's kind of how James feels about this David or Claude. He's basically saying that um, if this little cat that he has just found, this kitten that's in pretty bad shape, if David or Claude would have been with him, they probably would have shot at it with a slingshot and maybe killed it. And James doesn't feel that way. James wants to save the kitten. It says, the kitten makes a pitiful noise. Don't worry, I tell it, stroking its scabby head until the mewing is replaced by a faint purr. Everything will be okay. I'm gonna take you home and my mom will give you a bath and some medicine. I tuck the kitten under my jacket and run out of the woods across the street down the sidewalk towards my house. I feel the warmth of the kitten through my shirt and start thinking of names. So you can tell, obviously, this is a kitten that he thinks he's gonna nurture back to health and is gonna name it. So he's already decided this kitten is now like his pet. He says, I'm only 10. 
So it'll be five or six years before I work for Dr. Milk. My two oldest brothers worked for him part-time in summers when they were teenagers. Now my other brother, Paul, works there. Dr. Milk is the vet out on Ridge Road. He takes care of our dogs and he'll take care of my kitten. I never had a pet that was my very own. A couple of years ago, my father got a new beagle to replace the old one that had died. Patches was his name. He called the new one Bucky and said that Bucky could be mine, but saying a thing doesn't mean it is. So the dad keeps saying that the Bucky the dog is his, but really it's the dad's dog. He doesn't get to do the stuff that he would with, um, with Bucky the dog. Um, it's more treated like it stays outside. He wants a dog that will, can like sleep in his bed and he can watch TV with, and this is more of an outside dog. So not the kind of pet that he was hoping for. One thing I wanna point out to you is, did you notice the lines across the page here? You're gonna notice those throughout this story. These lines typically indicate a change in scenery. So here we're with the cat, he found the cat, he's gonna bring it home. And now in this area, he's giving us some background information. So we've kind of changed the scene. He's telling us about Dr. Milk and about his brothers and his um, past story with the dog. So I'll continue. It says, Bucky lives in a kennel out back keeping his beagle smell, which my mother hates, away from our house. I feel Bucky some days, I'm sorry, I feed Bucky some days and play with him, but I'm not allowed to bring him inside to sleep at the end of my bed or curl up next to me while I do homework. Bucky is an outdoor dog. He's a hunting dog. He's my father's dog, really. So now we see those lines again. We're going to kind of change scenery. He says, when I'm older, I will go hunting with my father the way my brothers have done. I try not to think about this. I want to go because I want my father to like me, but I don't want to kill animals. So he's kind of having some thoughts about this. He wants to go hunting so his dad will like him. That's kind of sad that he feels that way, but he really doesn't want to hunt, but he wants to go just for his dad to like him. One time when my father and three brothers went hunting, one of my brothers killed a deer. Most times they kill rabbits or pheasants if they get lucky. Most times they don't get lucky. But this time, one of my brothers, I don't remember which one, killed a deer. The deer was hung by its feet from a tree just outside the kitchen. I could see it hanging, or I could see it hanging there when I sat at my place at the table. My father urged me to eat my venison and talked about the slippers he was going to have made from the hide I couldn't eat. The thought of the venison made me want to throw up. So he gets a little descriptive there. He actually is eating dinner and can see, um, envision, I guess, the dead deer hanging from its feet outside of the kitchen window tree. Um, and he doesn't want to eat the, the venison meat, which is deer meat, if you didn't know. He doesn't want to eat that. But his dad just keeps talking about the stuff he's going to do with the dead deer. It's hide and make slippers out of it. And this just makes James want to barf. I could see the deer's eyes, even from the kitchen table. There was life in them still. Only the deer and I knew that there was still life that the bullet had missed. It was in the eyes. I pushed the venison away. My father said, that's a waste of good meat. My brothers teased me. One of them called me a sissy. My mother said, you don't have to eat it and took the slab of gray meat off of my plate. Okay, as somebody who grew up with a dad that hunted I did not like deer meat. Not because I so much was thinking about the deer that he had killed, uh, but maybe it was, now that I say it, maybe it was because of that. Just the thought of eating that kind of grossed me out and I didn't like to eat venison. And I felt this, I feel the same as James Howell, like, ew, gross. And I always tell my dad that, oh, it tastes gross. I don't like it. And maybe it's just the thought of it. Maybe it doesn't actually taste gross, but I think it's just more the thought of it that creeps me out from eating venison. So I think I feel similar to James and how he feels. 
And some of you guys are listening to this going to think we're crazy because you're hunters and you guys probably have venison meat all the time. But for some people, it just is the thought of it. My mother reached into my jacket and removed the kitten. Okay, so look, we had a change of scenery here. We're back in present time and he's home with the kitten. So I'm gonna start that again. My mother reaches into my jacket and removes the kitten by the scruff of its neck. She tells me to go down to the cellar and take off all my clothes and put them in a pile next to the washing machine. This animal is filled with disease, she said. We can't let it touch anything in the house. We'll take it to Dr. Milk, I said. He'll make it better. We'll see, she says, pushing me towards the cellar stairs, the kitten dangling from one of her hands. I can feel the tears welling up. But that kitten is mine, I said. I found it, and it's going to be my pet. She doesn't say anything. Looking up from the cellar stairs, I see her shaking her head at the kitten. Its eyes are clamped shut. I can see pus oozing out of them. You are a sorry sight, she tells the kitten in the same soothing voice she uses with me when I'm sick. A sad, sorry sight. I feel in the pit of my stomach what the future of that kitten is. I feel or the feeling spread through me like a sudden fever. Down in the cellar, taking off my clothes, I cry so hard, so hard, my body shakes. When I return upstairs, my mother wraps me in a bathrobe and holds me until I can speak. Where's the kitten, I ask. Okay, so he's pretty shaken up about the kitten and the mom is kind of given the tone like, uh-uh. This kitten's not going to stay here, but she also knows how much James already loves the kitten, even though he's had it for like five minutes, and she's trying to be nice about everything. Out on the back porch in a box, your brother will be home soon, is what the mom says to James about where the kitten is. So here's those lines again, kind of change of scenery, giving us some background information. Paul will be going to college in the fall. Right now, he's a senior in high school. I can't decide if I'm going to miss him or not. He's the brother I know best because he's been around the longest. The others left home when I was even younger. Paul is a brother who taught me to ride my bicycle and the one who spent an entire Saturday with me and not his friends building a real igloo out of snow and ice. He's the brother who tells me how to be a man. He's also the brother who plays tricks on me, and sometimes the tricks are even cruel. When I get angry, he says I don't have a sense of humor. He twists my arm behind my back sometimes until I say I'll do what he wants me to do. He makes me promises he doesn't keep. Paul is 17. He shaves every day, and he kisses girls right in front of me like it was nothing. He works at Dr. Milk's part-time and summers. So he feels like Paul is the brother that he should be closest to because his other brothers must be much older and moved away to college when he was still little. And even though James is 10 in this story and Paul's 17, Paul is the closest um, in age brother that he has. So still seven years apart. And obviously Paul's going to go away to college next year. But he looks up to Paul because that's his older brother. He knows he should, but then he goes into some details about how Paul treats him. And, you know, on one hand, Paul taught him a bunch of things, riding bikes, doing different things, spent an entire afternoon with him, making igloos outside when he could have been out with his friends, and he chose to hang out with James. But on the other hand, Paul, I think of my daughter in this one, sets him up for failure with things, plays mean, mean tricks on him just to see what will happen and watch him kind of fail at things and kind of gets laughs out of it. So uh, James is kind of torn on how he should feel about his brother, Paul. Oh, by the way, and then it, it tells us that Paul works with Dr. Milk, the vet, um, in, during part-time season or part-time during the school year, I should say, and then in the summers. He says, I'm sitting on the back porch waiting for Paul to come home and talking to the box next to me. 
Don't worry, Smokey, I tell the kitten inside. I won't let anything bad happen to you. I don't care how sick you are. My big brother will take you to Dr. Milk's and give you shots and medicine and stuff and you'll get better, you'll see. My big brother can fix anything. The kitten is awfully quiet. I wish it would make even a pitiful noise. We sit in silence and I daydream that I'm 17. I'm big and strong like my brother and I can make Smokey better. I see myself driving to Dr. Milk's out on Ridge Road, carrying the kitten in, in its box into the back room, which I have never seen really, only heard my brothers tell stories about it, giving it some medicine and reassuring it. Everything will be okay smoking, everything will be okay. In the kitchen behind me, I hear my brother and my mother talking in low voices. Okay, so he's never been to Dr. Milk's office, but he's envisioning how they're gonna bring the cat, which now you can see he's named Smokey, how they're gonna bring the cat to the vet and how his brother and um, the vet will be able to fix the cat. And then he does hear in the background while he's kind of daydreaming about this stuff that his brother has come home and the mom must be filling in Paul on what's going on with the cat. And they're kind of doing whispering voices, which doesn't seem, doesn't seem good. They're not cheerful. Let's just put it that way. Okay, so another one of those lines. So we're kind of doing a change of scenery. Dr. Milk is not there when my brother pulls the car into the parking lot. It's after hours. My brother has a key, and I'm impressed by this. Come on, Paul says in his take charge voice. Get that box now, bring it on in here. He flicks on the lights in the waiting room. You're coming in the back with me, he commands. I'll need your help. What are you gonna do? I ask. I'm holding the box tight against my chest. I feel Smokey moving around inside. What do you think, he says. You heard your mother. That kitten is sick, bad sick. She's your mother too, is how James replies. Well, she happens to be right, Paul tells me. With an animal that far gone, you don't have a choice. It has to be put to sleep. I think the tears I jam back into my body are going to kill me. I think if I don't let them out, they will kill me. But I won't let them out. I won't let Paul see. You do have a choice, is all I say. And I hug the box for dear life and move to the door. Paul moves faster. Come on now, he says, gently taking a hold of my arm. Be a man. So essentially, Paul's telling him they're going to put the cat to sleep and he's going to make James help him. Obviously, James does not want to do this, but his brother tells him the cat's too far gone. You've got to do this. Be a man. We're going to put the cat to sleep. He says, but I'm not a man, I tell him. I don't want to be. You've got to do what's right. That kitten is half dead as it is. Then it's half alive too. He shakes his head. You always have to one-up me, don't you, he says. I don't know what he means, but I do know that no matter what I say, he's going to do what he wants to do. A few minutes later, we are in the back room. The box is empty. Smokey is inside of a big old pretzel can with a hose attached, clawing at the can can's sides as my brother pumps in the gas. He is telling me it's good for me to watch this. It will toughen me up. It'll help me to be more of a man. Then he starts to lecture me about the different methods of putting animals out of their misery. But all I can hear is the scratching and then silence. Okay, so his brother, the cat's in this little pretzel can and his brother hooks up a hose to it and they pump in the gas and he can hear the cat scratching inside, and then he hears nothingness. All right, so it says, at the supper table that night, I don't speak. I don't look at my brother's face, or my father's, or my mother's. 
I look at the tree branch outside the kitchen window where the deer once hung. My brother says something about taking me to the driving range tomorrow. He will teach me to hit a golf ball. I won't go with him. I don't want him to teach me anything anymore. In the fall, he'll go off to college. I will be 11 and I will be alone with my parents, alone without my brothers. I get up from the table and nobody stops me. In the living room, which is dark, I sit for a long time thinking. I think, I think about my kitten. I think about the pretzel can. I think about what it'll be like not having any brothers around. And I feel alone and small and frightened. And then all of a sudden, I don't feel any of those things. All of a sudden, it's as if Paul had already left and I'm on my own and I know some things so clearly that I will never have to ask an older brother to help me figure them out. I will never work for Dr. Milk. I will not go hunting with my father. I will decide for myself what kind of boy I am and what kind of man I will become. So in the end, his family kind of lets him be at the dinner table and he's kind of sulking about having to put the cat to sleep. And his brother, I think trying to be nice is indicating he's gonna take him to the driving range tomorrow and teach him how to golf. And he doesn't wanna have anything he's decided to do with his brothers. And in this moment, remember before, he said he's gonna go hunting with his dad so his dad will like him. He's, you know, wants to hang out with his brother so his brother will like him. And now all of a sudden, after all this has happened, he's kind of made some choices on his own. He says, you know what, I'm still 11, I'm not a man. I'm not gonna be the kind of man when I grow up that you want me to be. I'm gonna be the kind of man that I wanna be. Um, and he's decided, I'm not going to go hunting. I'm not going to do that. Um, you know, I'm not going to be the person that you want me to be. I'm going to be the person that I want to be. So it's a sad story. I know. Um, it's, it's a story, just so you know, we're going to talk about a lot throughout this whole entire unit. Because there are, I know it's sad, but I know there's a lot of good things that we can pull out of this story too. And so notice this was a personal narrative where the character has learned a lesson. He's made um, the decision he's going to be the kind of man that he wants to be by the end of the story. So that's a good theme. Um, to have in your story, at least where there's a lesson learned, that means there's a point to the story. So we'll talk about this more when you guys come back to class. Thanks.